Thank you so much, Valentina. And thank you everyone for attending here today. Let me go ahead and get this up on our screen here. And what I'd like to run everyone through here today really is an opportunity to talk through how to make a difference by measuring more and reporting less. Whoops, let's keep it in full screen for everyone. And before I do that, I wanna spend just a minute kind of running through a bit about who I am. Valentina covered it exceptionally well. I won't belabor any points here, but I'm a value director at Koros, which means I work with our customers in both setting up a conceptual or hypothetical sense of what value might their community deliver for both their customers as well as their organization, and then also help quantify, measure, and grow that over time. I've been working with Koros, previously Lithium, for 15 years at this point, dating back to that PlayStation community. The reason I wanted to start there is not because I think you're particularly interested in my background, but because I think it does provide a little bit of context as to some of the experience that I hope I can convey here today, some takeaways that I've got from that broad purview, that sense of what community practitioners are doing. I wanna start by highlighting one of those commonalities that I found, which is that, and this is probably an understatement if ever there were one, community professionals love data, right? If it is a number, percentage, a rate, an average, we'll take it, right? And we will gather it, analyze it. Now, why is that the case though? I think we can tie this directly back to this really rich history that communities have of being constantly asked to justify their existence. What is the benefit of doing this for an organization? And I think it's fair to say that in response to that question, our approach largely has been one of just flooding the question asker with data, right? Look at everything I'm tracking as a way for you to be confident I know what I'm doing and kind of the subtext being, please leave me alone and let me do that, right? But I think there's a challenge inherent in that approach, which is that much of our data is not intuitively understandable or explainable. There is this large gap in understanding and knowledge between community practitioners and stakeholders and executives. And I don't say that in an attempt to demean stakeholders and executives, it's just the pragmatic reality of the fact community professionals have this rich history of two and a half decades, arguably more of experience, expertise, people, best practices to pull from to help contextualize our work. Executives and stakeholders don't always have that, which takes us to this concept that many of you might be familiar with already called the curse of knowledge. This is a term that was first used in the Journal of Political Economy in 1989. Fundamentally, all the curse of knowledge states is that the more you know about a topic, the less likely or maybe just the more challenging it may be for you to describe the benefit of that knowledge to someone else. Effectively, you are cursed with the knowledge of something and have this painful process by which you convey that to the recipient on the other side. I genuinely think this is the heart of the struggle when it comes to community measurement is that we struggle as community practitioners to communicate the robustness of things we know to someone that just by definition doesn't have the same level of familiarity with the concepts that we are attempting to convey. So that brings us back to the fundamental question and framework for today. How do we get better at this, right? How do we provide data that lends affirmation to ideas and suggestions we might have for our community program in a way that is genuinely convincing. And like any good consultant, let me start with a caveat up front. You all know your leadership, your organization, reporting preferences better than I do, certainly. So what I am hoping to convey here is not a dogmatic singular approach to measurement. This is the only way in which it can be done, but instead it's an option, right? It's something that may be helpful for some of the folks on the line that have run into this struggle with their leadership before. And frankly, it's not a particularly complex process. It's three prongs. You start with an idea. We deduce what information do we want to measure and gather to lend credence to the idea that we have. And then we tell a summarized, synthesized story about that process. So let's start with the idea. I mentioned earlier that I've been working with community teams that really run the gamut of tenure within the industry the age of their community, the kind of community, all of it. And for the life of me, I genuinely cannot recall ever speaking with a community practitioner that just said, gee, I have no idea what I should be doing next. 
it's almost always the opposite, right? I have so many ideas. I'm not sure which of them is most important, is most pragmatic, is going to be most beneficial here. There just isn't a shortage of ideas within the community practitioner space. There's a different challenge. There are struggles to get buy-in, buy-in by way of time, attention, resources, funding. And that's what I want to talk about today. This is as much an exercise in framing as it is anything else. What are the right questions that your reporting should seek to address to help you lend credence to the ideas that you already have? I'd like to step through just a couple of frameworks that help give a sense of how you can tackle that problem. Let me start by stepping through the value of community needs here. What you're looking at is an attempt to distill down the hundreds and hundreds of unique, well-constructed community strategies that you've all put together. Hopefully, your individual strategies will reintroduce the nuance that I've removed from the visualization here. But to be honest, there's a part of me that would be lying if I didn't say that I do think in some sense, all communities can sort of distill down into doing one, if not multiple of these three things. And I'll talk through them in just a moment here. The visualization that we're looking at, this is the blatant ripoff of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those unfamiliar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's sort of a framing device to think about human decision making. Effectively, it says we need our basic core needs met before we think about more adept mature needs. So for example, I need food, water, and shelter taken care of before I'm concerned with things like professional development or career aspiration. The basic need needs to be met first. This is really the community equivalent of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Communities at the base of the pyramid first seek to address and create a mechanism for service. It addresses the reality here that most community members' journey begins into the community with a transactional need of some kind. There is something that brings them through the front doors of our community, and the onus is on us to meet that pre-existing need. I'm going to be a little bit obnoxious about semantics, just one time here, I promise. And to talk about the term service here, we're using serve in lieu of support very purposefully in this case. Support tends to have a connotation to technical break fix kinds of questions. And it's a component of service, certainly. But serve is a broader, more proactive sense of benefit that you are attempting to convey to your community members. It's meeting them where they're at. So if you believe your community, your organization is focused on the serve layer of the pyramid here, some of the questions you might be seeking to address in your reporting should be, are we delivering an effective and satisfying experience for our members? Are we saving money as an organization by doing so? Once we then move to the second layer of the pyramid, when we've met the pre-existing need that someone comes inbound to us with, that's when we start thinking about expansion and the robustness of community really comes to life. It's about connecting people to each other, about listening to the feedback and insights that they are providing to one another, enriching knowledge, introducing new possibilities here. Here we think about the expansion from the customer's perspective about the realm of the possible, right? What could I do that I had never even conceived of that other community members can bring to bear for me? In terms of business benefit on this side, sometimes we tie that back to things like retention, revenue, but fundamentally, what are the questions that a community focused around listening and connecting with their community members might want to see addressed in their reporting? Are we expanding the knowledge and capability of our community members? How are they putting that into practice? Do we see different performance by our community members compared to non-community members? And finally, oops, then we look at the top of the pyramid here, which is focused around collaboration. Members with members, members with the organization. Here we think about interaction with your community as a mechanism by which your organization changes based off of the feedback from community members rather than the other way around. Questions here that your reporting might be seeking to address. What are we doing differently as an organization that our community caused? Do we see these actions that we've taken actually improving or modifying the performance of our business, of our organization? So knowing the right question, clearly a critical step. Then you have to answer the questions, right? How do we go about doing that? This becomes the data collection exercise. As is probably painfully clear at this point, I really like having structures to move through, an organizational framework to organize my thoughts. Maturity models are a great way of trying to break apart the really hard question of what do I do next into component parts. 
And there are some excellent community maturity models that have been around for a long time. The Community Roundtable has a great model. Feverbee has a community lifecycle model that effectively lays out how communities progress over time. I still found myself running into challenges around prioritization when looking at maturity models. After understanding kind of where we're at today as a framework for our community, what do we do next? How do we make the case for it? So to that end, we put together a maturity model at Coros focused around customer engagement through two primary lenses. The first of which is thinking about direct engagement with community members. And that manifests through what value are we providing to them? How are we playing and appearing in that journey? And what presence are we taking in that process? There's then a series of focus areas that are a bit more internally minded. How is our organization maintaining that process internally in terms of what we are tracking, in terms of how we are literally set up organizationally, as well as what supporting technologies that we might be using in order to do all of this. Each of these are measured on a scale of one to five in terms of maturity and complexity. We'll kind of set that to the side for today. I think sufficient to say that fundamental division between external operations and internal operations, it's a helpful way to make sure that the data we do gather is telling a holistic story and then allows us to start to prioritize improvement areas. So we've been talking about this theoretically so far. I want to switch gears just a little bit and tell a story about how this comes to life. And to be clear, it is a story that lacks an ending. It is one we are continuing to live out here at Coros. So I want to talk a little bit about the Atlas community. I'd mentioned earlier that we've performed about 75 maturity assessments gauging where is a community program and how can we help with the roadmap construction process. Part of that has been some self-reflection work, looking at our own community. Atlas is Coros's community, I should mention. It is a CMX award finalist and a Stevie award winning community, no less. And in terms of conveying credit where credit is due, I do not sit on the Atlas team at Coros. There is a group of exceptionally talented individuals who are actually responsible for all of the great things I'm going to be telling their story today. So all credit belongs with them. But our community's mission is broad. Fundamentally, it's kind of geared towards self-service for our customers, thereby providing cost deflection to our business, as well as increasing customer satisfaction and capability, empowering them to do new and cool things, thereby <laughs> improving retention and feature adoption for our business. There are some secondary measures focused around things like getting information in front of prospective customers, generating demand, but how do we go about actually measuring all of this? This really is the crux of it, right? How do I turn what is a pretty hypothetical or theoretical story into something discrete? I wanna track the progress of one specific measure using Atlas as a backdrop for what this might look like in practice. And I wanna start by talking about a singular metric visits. Our community received 716,618 visits over the 12 months that I was measuring in this particular case. Clearly a critical measure, an important measure to be aware of, but to be a little bit silly, does it convey anything about the value? If our Atlas team went to our stakeholders and said, hey, fantastic news, we had 716,000 visits, I'll be taking no further questions. Does that do anything for us, right? It's insufficient in and of itself. I think broadly, we all recognize that, right? The, the progress of vanity metrics is well known within community practitioners. So what might I do? Maybe I add another metric to the story, right? I add logins. Just south of 400,000 people signed into our community over the same period of time. Again, as a community practitioner, as someone that has the curse of knowledge, as it were, immediately I look at these two numbers and my mind starts reeling, right? Well, that's a lot of sign-ins compared to visits. That's exceptionally high. What's going on, right? But for an individual, a stakeholder that again, lacks that day-to-day -day context, these two numbers aren't even necessarily related to one another. So it's still an insufficient story. So what if I had one more metric to the case, right? I look at how many searches were conducted in our community that did not produce results. In our case, it was 8,010. So again, as a community practitioner, immediately, I feel like I've got a complete story here, right? Here's what I know. 716,000 people visited our community, 400,000 of them signed in. That's an extremely high sign-in rate for a B2B high-tech community. But then I look at that 8,010 searches without results and some alarm bell starts ringing in the back of my mind, right? Why is that so high? And I realize I can filter it back through that logins measure. The reason it's so high is because so much of our content requires sign-in to see, 
That's also why our sign-in rate is so high, is that we're kind of cooking the books in our favor in that regard. In order to see the content, you have to be signed in. But for the 40 to 45% of people who don't sign in, they're ineligible from finding content that does exist. So I realized this ties back to an enhancement, an idea that I've had about our community for years. We should make the process of accessing content easier. But does this data get me there, right? Does this allow me to tell that story, make that request of our stakeholders? It really doesn't, right? It requires too much understanding of connecting the dots between these three distinct data points. So what do we do? We add more context, right? Maybe we pull some more metrics. It just so happens, we also run a survey on our community. It asks a couple of questions. It asks, why are you here today? Did you find what you were looking for? What would you have done if you hadn't found it? How satisfied are you with the experience? Here, I'm looking at some data that shows the correlation between, did you find what you were looking for? In Atlas's case, it was 68% of survey respondents said, yes, I did, I found what I was looking for. And it looks at that correlation to CSAT, the percentage of individual respondents who said either I was very satisfied or satisfied with the experience. Further, what I've done in addition to plotting Atlas in kind of the pink there is I've shown our performance compared to 60 some odd other Coros communities for which we have this data. So now I'm thinking to myself as a community practitioner, okay, I've taken a bunch of metrics and I've filtered it through customer feedback. I've shown correlation. I've shown progress against other competing or similar communities maybe. Does this get stakeholders what they're looking for in order to buy into my idea to make content more publicly accessible? It just still isn't there, right? There is still too much that is needed from the individual stakeholder to get the crux of what I'm requesting. So what do I do? I go to the final step here. And to be clear, I'm gonna tell a story around case deflection. I wanna make sure I'm conveying extremely clearly. I know one of the things community can be guilty of is turning everything into a case deflection problem in some regard. There are any number of other models here by which you can communicate value. Case deflection is important and salient. For our example case in Atlas here, you might tell the story through impact to retention, improvements to revenue, uh, customer empowerment by way of feature adoption, anything else. I'm going to tell the story of deflection here for a couple of reasons. It's salient for Atlas. Frankly, it's the easiest to measure, so it works in my favor in that regard too. But let me go back to this visits number that we started with. For those of you that have a particularly acute eagle eye, you may have noticed that that 716,000 visits number shrunk to 500,000 here. What I've done oops, is twofold. First, in order to make sure that I'm providing some degree of proprietary protection of performance for Atlas. I obfuscated numbers in this slide. Everything else is legitimate till this point. This is hypothetical. The other thing that I decided to do is just make some nice round numbers for us. So the math is kind of coherent as we're carrying forward here. So for example's sake though, let's say we had 500,000 visits to our community. Based off of our survey, we know that 50% of survey respondents, if they are going to be representative of the broader whole, say they came to our community for support purposes. So what I do is I set to the side the other 250,000 that were here for any other reason. They're important, I'm concerned about them, they're not salient to this story. I set them to the side. Then I layer on top of that, what percentage of individuals said, yeah, I found what I was looking for here today. Let's say it's 70%. Again, I set the 30% that didn't find what they were looking for to the side, leaving me at step three with 175,000 people who came to my community looking for support, found what they were looking for. Finally, I ask a question around, so glad you found your answer. If you hadn't, realistically, were you ever gonna contact support? Or are you the kind of person that I think I am, where I would just stew in anger silently on the other side of my screen? I'd never submit a support ticket. Let's say that 25% of people found themselves in the inverse. They said, I would absolutely submit a support ticket. That gives us 43,750 people who came to the community for support, found what they were looking for, and are at least telling us they would have submitted a ticket had they not. I can multiply that by my average support cost of $25, giving me a $1.1 million deflection. Fantastic, right? But what does this let me do? First and most clearly, I can claim success for $1.1 million of deflection value. But second, I get to tie some of that inefficiency, some of those enhancements that I want to see in the community directly to this report. So. I've made my recommendation. I wish content could be in front of the sign-in gate to make the process of findability easier. And I've given a little bit of data as to what our state of play is today. We're saving $1.1 million. Now I just show the impact. If we were to move that content in front of the sign-in gate, 
I think we have two impacts, right? We increase visits to the community. There's more content for Google to find and index. I also take into consideration our standard community growth rates. And I think we can drive an improvement of 12% by virtue of making that change. Further, I think it improves our ability to deliver on a resolution rate by a conservative 2% of those 8,000 searches that were performed, we can show existing content that maps to it. And I hold everything else steady. Same percentage of people seeking support, same percentage who say they would have contacted support otherwise, giving us a $1.26 million of deflection. Said differently, simply by moving content in front of the sign-in gate, I think we can save an additional $160,000 in support cost per year. Pretty powerful terse statement, but it still requires yet one more step, which is turning this process and boiling it into the one to two sentences that anyone's ever going to actually remember. So I have to put it all together, right? What was my idea? More of our content should probably be easier to find. What's the data that I gathered? Well, currently we're deflecting a million dollars of support cost, but only a little bit more than 50% of people sign into our community and have the capability of seeing the content that they're interested in finding. So if we just make that content more accessible, we can save an additional $160,000 as well as genuinely improving the customer experience. Lastly, I wanna talk about how you turn that into the kind of quick soundbite blurb. This is not an uncommon approach to describing success. I first heard it described by Brian Oblinger. As a side note, y'all should be listening to the In Before the Lock podcast that Brian and Erica run, it's fantastic. But it effectively says, take your initial value statement and simply kind of twist it around, dependent on who you're speaking with. So if I'm talking to a customer support team within my organization, I might convey something that says, we're saving a million dollars a year by allowing customers to find their own answers, but we plan on growing that to one and a quarter this year by making that content easier to find. But if I'm talking to a customer success team, I'm not gonna emphasize deflection. They might find it interesting, they clearly understand it, but it's not the most salient point for that audience. I would instead say, our community has a high CSAT score of 48%. We wanna make it even higher by improving findability this year. So finally, to kind of wrap things up, that's really it. We open with that context, our hypothesis. We gather some data that allows us to affirm the validity of our idea. And then we tell a very quick and tight story about the impact that we'd like to do. Effectively, we take the hours of work and preparation and boil it down to one sentence, which I recognize is really frustrating, right? We spend all this time and it becomes a sentence. I always like to think of this quote from Mark Twain that an English teacher of mine really liked, corny, I know. He starts writing a long letter to a friend and prefaces it all with saying, sorry for the long letter, but I just didn't have time to write you a short one. I think that really gets at the benefit that community practitioners convey in reporting. We do not serve a function that is just pure aggregation of information its synthesis, its summary, and its action. And with that, I don't know how much time we've got left for questions, but happy to take any questions. Hello, well, thank you so much. That was such an insightful presentation. And I'm, my head is just like bursting with how much information you shared. So I'm so glad that we are recording this so we can rewatch it over and just like really kind of I want to take questions, but we don't have any in the q and I'm going to double check in the session chat. You've answered everyone's questions, clearly. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, but please give a big round of applause to John in the chat. Um, you can't hear them, but they are like <laughs> and all sorts. Um, oh, there's a question. Hmm, I don't. Oh, no. I can't see any questions on my side. So if someone would like to like copy and paste it into the session chat, maybe. Can you see any questions on your side, John? I, yeah, I see, I see a couple. I'll see. Just see. Okay, you go ahead because I can't see them. Perfect. <laughs> no, not at all. So I see a question from Piper that says, is it possible to prove causation? It's a really critical question. I think particularly when we think about retention and spend in particular, I think you're getting at the root of it, right? Is it that the community is specifically driving those improvements or does it just have this natural gravity of pulling the people predisposed to do that there in the first place? I think of kind of two answers to that question. One is we can look at it longitudinally. If we look at a customer that was 
performing behaviors prior to visiting community, visited community, do we see behavior change on the other side of that experience? That's one way of sort of answering the question. I think that's probably the legitimate way. I have to admit there's a glib part of me that says, I don't really care, right? Like if I've got an aggregation of people that are more predisposed to retain or spend more, that in and of itself is of value to me, right? Whether I have driven it specifically or not, the fact that I have them attentively, that's my primary concern. So I think about the longitudinally as a way of saying, I know I need to satisfy the concern, but fundamentally, I just want to talk to those people and they're showing up anyway. So that's the benefit for me. Definitely. All right. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Perfect. Let me look. I think one of the other consistencies, I think I can, oh, are they appearing for you now, Valentina? I uh, know I can't see anything. I've okay. Looked at okay. The it's like nothing. So apologies, everyone. No, not at all. And, and I think the other one, kind of the theme that I'm seeing from folks, and I realize I'm guilty of one of the things that irks me is that what do we do beyond support deflection here, right? What are some of the other impacts that we can start to show? I think we edged into an answer on that in the previous question around causation. Really, to me, the big ones are retention, it's upsells, it's renewals, it's cross-sells, time to value. And there, I think we do live in the realm of two things. It's correlation and it's longitudinal studies, right? What can we see in terms of change to behavior over time? And admittedly, I don't want to convey that this is a straight, that's harder than deflection, inarguably, right? It just, it requires more synthesis of data between systems. So it's tougher. And I think that's in large part why we see a lot of gravity towards deflection, right? Is I can contain it within one environment in that way. Definitely. Well, we are out of time. I know there's probably some other questions. So how can people get in touch with you um, to get answers to their questions, John? Absolutely. Please feel more than free to reach out on LinkedIn, send connections. Happy to chat with folks about this if there's anything that I unfortunately wasn't able to touch on that you all find interesting. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming to CMX Summit today and sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge. We are going to be back in just a few minutes with another another speaker. We're moving very quick. We're going to be talking about increasing community engagement through a top contributor program. So I'll be back here in a few minutes. Thank you, John, and I will see you soon. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks, Valentina.